Paul Broder is running for mayor of Melrose. Now serving his fifth two-year term, Representative Paul Broder was first elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in November of 2010. Before serving in the House of Representatives, Paul's career as an attorney focused on public service. First, by serving as an assistant district attor attorney in the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. And later, by serving as counsel for the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Paul worked diligently to protect our community's most vulnerable members, namely our seniors. Further, Paul understands the unique struggles our cities and towns face thanks to his nine years of service on the Melrose Board, Board of Aldermen. As president of the board, Paul was able to build consensus, which is not easy to do, and set a legislative agenda focused on what he calls sustainable growth and fiscal responsibility. In the House of Reps, Paul has sponsored and advocated for the passage of several key pieces of legislation, which I intend to cover with him tonight, if he's so willing and if there is time. In his first term, Paul drew on his professional expertise to call for the creation of an Elder Protective Services Commission. Paul then introduced legislation the commission recommended and is now, now advocating for a bill which would create a specialized elder financial exploitation prevention. What a term. Exploitation prevention. An investigation team. Shielding seniors from onerous financial products as well as fraud and exploitation by caretakers. He also proudly co-sponsored an act relative to healthy youth which ensures that sex education in Massachusetts is age appropriate and medically accurate. Following a series of tragic deaths, Paul introduced legislation which would keep our schools, public buildings, and businesses safe by requiring carbon monoxide detectors in all structures where people congregate. His budgetary advocacy has brought hundreds, thousands of dollars back to the communities of Molden, Melrose, and Wakefield, empowering economic development, ensuring quality education, and improving municipal services. Paul, a product of Melrose Public Schools, very impressive public schools, and getting better by the year. And of course, with this legislative agenda, they will become um, better, I hope. Holds degrees from Lafayette College and Suffolk Law School. He and his wife, Liz, live in Melrose, where they are raising their two sons, Ethan and Sam. Welcome to our family, St. Paul Broad. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, here are some of his um, honors, uh, which you should be proudly proud of, and awards. Let me mention a few. Sure. Association of Developmental Disabilities Providers, Legislator of the Year, 2019. Workforce Solutions Group, Legislator of the Year, 2018. Wakefield Main Streets, Legislator of the Year, 2018. Children's Trust, Valuing of Children Award, 2018. Mass Insights Chairman's Award for Support of Advanced Placement Education, 2017. And finally, National Association of Social Workers, the Massachusetts Chapter Legislator of the Year, 2015. 
Now. How long have you been in Melrose for? My family moved here in 1969, right before I started kindergarten at the Roosevelt School mm -hmm. over on Vane Street. Mm -hmm. uh, let's discuss about your um, careers. Sure. Uh, I know uh, from what I from what I've read in the in the introduction that I read, and also your awards that you're primarily a lawyer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Truth be told, I got out. I, I went to law school about five years after I graduated from Lafayette, mm -hmm. and for that, for those five years, roughly in between undergrad and going to law school, I was a computer programmer, or software engineer. Uh -huh. um, but that's really an evolving term. I was a computer programmer. And this is before the days of cell phones or even laptops. We had wow. these big old mainframes, and I did what they called administrative applications. Incredible. How many years ago was this? Were that you? was from, so I graduated from college in 1986 uh -huh. and started law school in either 1990 or 1991. So that, that interim time. We graduated around the same time, it seems. Now, how did you become an uh, older man? What do we, we don't call them older men in certain cities. We call them city councils, yep. uh, correct? Yep. So we're, in, we're kind of in a transition right now. Yeah. What's the, what's the story behind that? Why? So yeah. I think uh, um, alderman is a term of art from back in the day, as they mm -hmm. say. It started, I suspect, in, uh, over in England, where a lot of our you know, government traditions came from in some respects. Mm -hmm. And the term, like a lot of things, hung on, kind of got past its prime. And there are kind of two problems, I suppose, with, with that term. It, alderman does not really describe inclusively uh, who makes up the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably just as importantly, no one really understands what the term means. And when I was an alderman and people would ask, uh, when you'd say, I'm running for alderman, well, yeah. well what is that? What is and that? you would say, well, it's, it's a city council, basically. Yeah. And then they, and, you know, light went on and, and, they, and they got it. And mm -hmm. so over time, um, cities and towns in Massachusetts have moved away from those terms. Uh, in towns, it, it tended to be selectmen, mm -hmm. and they've moved to phrases like in Wakefield Town Council, mm -hmm. uh, select board in mm -hmm. other places. Mm -hmm. um, and Melrose has kind of caught it with chased the trend mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what makes it uh, interesting in certain respects, as someone who's been a, a, a city councilor and now in the legislature, is uh, you learn a little bit about how the the structure works. And by that, I mean, every city and town technically is a creation of the state legislature. They get their charter or their organizational document approved of by the legislature, and that's how they come into being. And if you want to make a change, like um, the change in, of, your, of your legislative body, which is contained in the charter, you essentially have to ask the legislature through what's called a home rule petition. Mm -hmm. So maybe, uh, I'm saying maybe 10 or 15 years ago, um, I tried it and was, was not at all successful. It really didn't get off the launch pad. Uh, and then uh, uh, Alderman Lammerman, the, the Ward 2 Alderman, and now the president of the Board of Aldermen, uh, pushed it much more effectively, um, mm -hmm. developed that. It failed the first time out, kept working at it, developed consensus to, mm -hmm. to pass what's called uh, a home rule petition, which is the way a city or town can request that change from the legislature. Uh, and the reason why I say it's not a done deal is because right now that petition is in the process of being considered by the legislature. It gets assigned to a committee, uh, the, in this case, the Committee on Municipalities. That hearing has taken place, and the committee has passed that out so that it can be, that's just the next step in the process. It's now what we call the, uh, in the Committee on Bills in the Third Reading, and I expect in fairly short order, we'll move through the rest of the process and become law. Uh, technically a state law, but here in Melrose, and then the board will actually be the Melrose City Council. Mm -hmm. You're also simultaneously uh, working at the State House as a representative. Well, that's what I do. That yeah, is, that is my job. Do. Yep. I see. Uh -huh. Describe that for me. How do, how, do you, uh, how do you compare that with your potential job as a mayor? Oh, I mean, what it, would the differences? Sure. Then? So, I mean, yeah. it, it's it's different in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, a lot of the same skill sets, familiarity with how government works, experience working with a bureaucracy and advocacy, those are all 
important skills for both jobs. Uh, but it's the difference between being an executive and being a legislator. So, you know, as, as an executive, you're essentially, you know, to analogize it to private sector, yeah. you know, you're the CEO, right? You, the buck stops with you and you, you know, like the governor on the state level, I suppose, you know, guide policy, you're a strong executive and have a lot of opportunities to make change in your community. Obviously, again, you have to build consensus. You have to get the populace on board. You have to get the legislature on board, in this case, the Board of Aldermen. Um, and in the legislature, in, in my case, you're one of 160 people. And you can, uh, the best part about the job in certain respects is you can pick from amongst a range of issues. You can advocate for whatever you want, whatever interests you, whatever you think is important to you, um, your constituency, your community, whatever the case may be. And then you build that consensus, build a coalition, and then essentially, if you can make it through the process, it goes to the governor, which is, you know, again, the analogy to the mayor mm -hmm. to, to drive that change. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a different set of responsibilities, um, but again, the same kind of skill set. And, and you bring, I think, the same passion to it, you know, that, that what motivates you to do the job and do it well is to make things a little bit better for the people you represent. I and I think all good people in public service and politics um, strive for that, and that is their motivation. They might come at it different ways, they might come to different conclusions, but that is what uh, motivates the overwhelming number of the folks that I've served in city government with and at the state level. Mm -hmm. It is a full-time position? It is. <coughs> uh -huh. it is. So it's 8 to 4, 8 to 5, 8 to 6? Not really. That. It doesn't exactly work that way. Yeah. Uh, it, it depends on the kind of the time of year. And different legislators have different responsibilities depending on um, the position they hold within the legislature, as an example. So I'm, I, when you start out, yeah. you get assigned to a bunch of communities, um, excuse me, to a bunch of committees. Committees, yeah. And... Um, in some respects, it's a it's a big learning curve, and you need to learn the ropes of the place. Um, as you kind of move through the process, if you're a little bit more successful, um, and there's a recognition that you might have a particular skill set or yes. issue set, um, you can become a committee chair. And I so see. I am in my second term as the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Labor and Workforce Development, which is kind of a mouthful, but is really exactly what what it sounds like. Uh -huh. it, what, what, what is that about? So labor you know, work, obviously, yes. uh -huh. and in the, in the case of state law, it really is about, in a lot of respects, unions and collective bargaining and I the see. ability to organize in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And workforce development focuses on uh, exactly what it sounds like. Are we, uh, are we creating a workforce that's going to sustain the Massachusetts economy? Uh -huh. Are we going to... Uh, are we connecting again, kind of education and training with opportunities that exactly that actually exist in the workplace as it stands today and as it might change and evolve in the future? How big is the committee, all the committees, the committee that you're working in? It all depends. It's so all depends. my uh -huh. committee is, you know, it's, it's a majority of House members and um, a, a small group of senators. And that's because the House is four times bigger than the, than the Senate. Um, Different committees. So the the probably the you know the biggest committee is the committee on ways and means, which is um, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably thirty plus people. Wow. My committee is closer to half that, uh, and, this is, and that's all set within uh, the House and Senate rules and the joint rules that govern our kind of our interactions and the way Same. and the way we do business. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, the clerk decides which bills come to us. I so see. at the beginning of the we have we run in a two year session. The yeah. first 19 months or so of that are what we call formal session. Um, and then there's informal sessions after that. Technically, the Massachusetts legislature is always in session. Uh, the Constitution says that. Um, and that contrasts to some other states that have all different kind of schemes or approaches to how their, how their legislatures work. But in our case, most bills get filed within the first two weeks or so mm -hmm. of, the, of that two-year session. Mm -hmm. and then they all go to the clerk who decides what the appropriate committee or jurisdiction is. So mm -hmm. if it is something about crime and punishment, it might yeah. go to public safety or the judiciary committee. Okay. If it's an issue about a new training program, probably comes to my committee. 
Ah, so you are the chair of that committee. Exactly. And I said, so there is a, a House chair for the House of Reps and a Senate chair from the Senate side, but we, we, we do that business together. It's, you know, it's not two separate entities. It's a joint committee and it's co-chaired by myself in this session, Senator Jalen of Somerville. Remarkable. So you must know the governor quite well. Since he's quite well, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure do about that. you have that. coffee with him? Or not what? so much that. Uh, we do have the opportunity to uh, interact <laughs> around a lot of the committee work that's gone on, yeah. uh, both last session and this session. Had a lot of opportunities to interact with the governor, his senior staff, and there's a secretariat within the governor's office called the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development mm -hmm. that we work very closely with mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. What have you learned from the styles of the governor? Say that, that again? I'm sorry. What have you learned from the styles of the governor? Oh, from the style of the, the governor? governor. Uh, I will say this, the governor is um, not particularly partisan. He, he's a registered Republican, uh, but he's very good at reaching across the aisle. Um, he is very good at collaborating with us. And at least the opportunities that I've had to work with the administration, we've had to work, we've done some fairly big things that have required a lot of cooperation because you know, basically the way state government works from a governance perspective is the legislature creates programs, budgets, whatever the case may be, and it's the governor's job to execute or implement those plans. So you really, you know, you want to have a reasonable degree of cooperation and consensus because it's easy to pass stuff, but if you want it to be successful, you know, the bureaucratic piece, the execution, which is the governor's responsibility. I see. You, you'd be well. running as a Democrat, correct? So here in Melbourne, I mean, I, no, as I run Mel for yes. the legislature, mm -hmm. I'm a registered Democrat, and uh -huh. that's the way, you know, our system is set up. So there's yeah. primaries, and then you go forward to a general election. Uh, in municipal elections here in Melrose, and yes. really throughout Massachusetts, I yeah. think, uh, the the elections are nonpartisan. So in I the see. mayor's race, um, the, right now there are five folks running. Yes. And not all the same party, but we're all yes. kind of, we, we all compete to see who will get the top two spots. Okay. And that's in the, that's the summer, September. And because it's nonpartisan, it's called the preliminary instead of a primary. And the two top vote getters would move on to the general election in November, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of party. It's whoever the top two are. And that person will take office yeah. after the election. <coughs> now, <coughs> I've learned so much from you in such a short period of time. Uh, it appears that you're quite uh, a seasoned legislator. That's fair to say. Mm -hmm. So, that uh, that's true. Are you going to be bored, do you think? Oh, no. To, to become a mayor? Oh, because no. the Not at all. The Not state job all. is so exciting. It, it's exciting. Well, Merrill's is just a small town, and you'll be a small town mayor. I don't and you've think been so. shouldering with big wigs. Uh, Perhaps. Well, I mean, you always. The governor himself and so on. You always have to come home, okay. right? And it, it's. It's, you know, you got to connect your job with your values. Okay. And I will say, I mean, I love my job. Mm -hmm. I love my job. It's fun to get up every day. There is always a new challenge. Yeah. There's always new people to meet. It also can be a little bit frustrating. In sometimes. what way? Let's talk about because, the frustration. Because you have to, you know, the, the, the building of consensus can be hard. And yeah. what you need more than anything else is good humor, and a lot of patience. I see. Uh, because the work we do, both at the city level and the state level, certainly true at the, the, you know, the federal level, is very serious. But some folks, I think, sometimes um, take themselves a little bit too seriously. Uh -huh. You know, you don't, it's, it's, it, it's a job you hold until the next person gets the job. It's not your job or your seat. Uh, and you have, to, you have to be mindful of that. And you also have to be mindful that Every one of the, you know, there's, I serve with 159 other people yeah, that's what in I the meant. House. Yeah. And they all got legitimately elected with very differing ideas. And while you might not agree with those ideas, you have, certainly have to be respectful of the Absolutely. fact that they got elected. That's they right. earned the office. And they they earned it the same way I did. And it doesn't matter if you've been there 30 years or you're in your first term. There is... The fact that you got elected and you're speaking for somewhere between 40 and 42,000 people, that's your, your constituency, matters. Excuse me. And everyone deserves to have you know, their opportunity to speak up. And most, you know, legislators got 
that opportunity by getting a majority of people that are voting in their district to say, I want that person to, to represent me. So you really can't discount, at least at face value, what, what ideas those folks bring to the table. Hmm. Um, Just but that means yes. you take a lot of time and you got to exactly. listen to a lot of folks and sometimes, you know, things that you don't think, this is a great idea. Why aren't we doing it? Okay. Uh, a lot of times it's good reasons. Hmm. Uh, for the benefit of, uh, of, your, of the voters so that they could know you mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of uh, mayor that you're going mm -hmm. to be. Uh, single out a bill or an experience or an event that was difficult to challenge at the state rep, but you triumphed. Mm -hmm. If you have triumphed, how did you triumph? What must you have done oh, to goodness. pull that bill through? Oh, goodness. Uh, successfully. Just uh, one bill oh. or one event. We have time. So one oh. hour into it. I mean, again, patient, patience is a virtue. And I'll talk about, uh, there's so many, so there's, so there's two, there's kind of two pieces to okay. the rep job. And it, again, it analogizes pretty well in some respects to the mayor's job. Okay. Um, you want to pass big bills, make big changes, and that's part of the job. Just like being a mayor, you have initiatives that you might want to, you might want to take care of, like big changes, changing the way we do our schools, making a big change in the way we do transportation or energy or whatever the case may be. Uh, and those are big, important ideas to move on. Uh, but it's also helping people one on one when they present a problem yeah. that might not necessarily be a so-called legislative problem or a mayoral problem. It's someone presents with a challenge, for example, a, a gentleman who, who uh, was entitled to some benefits and for some defects in the law and some problems with the bureaucracy, uh, didn't get what I felt he deserved. Because I could you know, touch the right people in the bureaucracy and advocate for him, I was able to turn that benefit stream on. And that's that's real money to a real person who has real needs. Yes, that's, exactly. That did not change the world. That did not fix the system. That changed. But it made a difference for him. It changed the condition life. of one human being. That can be. You as, made government yeah. real. And that can tie, I mean, <coughs> that, that, that um, roughly analogous maybe to the mayor's thing, the mayor's job is, you know, a, a constituent here in Melbourne. Incredible. I think we're now. Uh, solving the same. Ripe and ready. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to discuss the mayorship. Uh, there was a reason behind why uh -huh. I spent quite a bit of time on uh, your legislative uh, skills, activities, mm -hmm. uh, accomplishments, passions, and interests. Uh, but of course, you're not running for, for, for that position because right. you are in that position already. Now you want to become a mayor. Mm -hmm. I want you to make a case for why you want to become a mayor. A detailed case. A detailed case. That's a long story, I suppose. And it really, it's, it's quite all right. We I have mean, time. It starts, it's, it really starts in certain respects back in 1969. My family moved here. I mean, I'm a kid. Right? I'm, I'm about to start kindergarten. And we came from Burlington, Massachusetts. We had a very small, I'm, I'm the youngest of seven. Mm -hmm. And we had a house that is small in the studio. And we were packed in pretty tight. Uh, and it was you know, it was time time to move. And you know, I was too little to know exactly what was going on. Yes. Um, but my parents were looking for what I think everyone who moves here, and everyone who's a you know as a family, uh, is looking for. Yes. Good schools, safe streets, you know, nice neighborhoods, uh, and nice neighbors. Yes. And that's what we have here. I mean, we've had good times and bad, but we've always had that that core. And so you think to yourself, as you know, as I've grown up here, um, the city's given me and my family so much. It's now four generations of my parents still live here, down to my nephew and his wife and their kids. Uh, and the city keeps coming through for us. You know, the education system has moved my family ahead. And it's moved my, my my kids ahead. It's moved my nephew's kids ahead. And that, you know, that gets into your your bones of course a little right. bit it makes you passionate and it makes you yeah it makes you want to make sure that 
the people that are coming after you, the people that have stayed here and built it for you so you can succeed, so you can thrive, can do a little bit better. Can just do a little bit better than they did the day before. And it's not some, some grand plan, but it gets into your bones growing up here. When, you know, it's, also, it's a place where you know, if you make a mistake, the community lifts you up. And that's a big thing too. You know, Absolutely. because it's 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 hard being a kid, even in even in a great city. It can be challenging if you live alone, if you're aging, um, if you have an idea for a small business that you really think could take off. You want folks that that share that passion, that really take personal pride and community pride in the fact that you chose to come here, and that you you can succeed and you can be part of the community and make it better. That's wonderful. That's that's the passion. And I think a lot of people have that passion. And if you can harness that and bring it together, which people have, I mean, that's, that's the lesson I've learned along the way from, 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 from past leaders. And I don't mean just mean government leaders, community leaders. There are so many people in this community uh, who have given so much of their life in whatever way to the community without ever serving in government, without ever being an elected official. And I like to say to folks, a lot of times I get to talk to students and sometimes politics gets a bad name. And that's, that's so sad because politics done right is public service and engagement and democracy and building consensus and moving people forward. Not meaning that everyone's always going to agree, but creating an atmosphere where at least in the times where you might lose, you still feel like you had a shot and you were engaged and folks, and folks listen. Uh-huh. That's, I mean, I think that that ethic is so important, and, that, and that's across public service. What I like to say to, to kids is, it's really important to you that you connect to your community, that you become an active member of your community. It doesn't have to be at all being an elected official. That's just the way I did it, and some other people do it. But it's just as important to be, if 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 it's your thing, to be an active member of your church, your community group. Or create your own thing that that works for you, and that and that enriches the community more, and leads to positive change. In, so, quite, hopefully, that, that's a, uh, uh, of course, it's, um, it's it's very consistent uh, with what I observed. Um, I don't know whether you recall this or not. Uh, I have seen you twice, maybe three times, mm-hmm. at Dunkin' Donuts okay. yeah. so, next door, mm-hmm. in which I write every day. I'm mm-hmm. a professional writer. Yep. And there is a group uh, that meets there from mm-hmm. 8 to 10. I have seen you interacting mm-hmm. with some of these elders. Uh, not all of them are necessarily mm-hmm. elders. A few of them are young. Yep. I liked what I saw. Uh, oh, that's uh, nice I was quite happy to eventually discover that you'll be running uh, for mayor. Because I noticed then that you have qualities that I expect should be present in a mayor, most particularly respect and curiosity, um, and willing and, and able to spend time with the community dwellers mm-hmm. and make diligent effort to hang out where they hang out. I couldn't think of a better place than Dunkin' Donuts in which this could happen. And I noticed twice that as you were doing this, you were not necessarily campaigning. That was not the feeling that I had because I didn't know that you were running uh, for, for anything. Uh-huh. All, all that I knew is that you were the youngest member and in that uh, they were firing questions at you, most particularly one curious gentleman, yeah. a very bright um, older man. I will not give the name. Uh, you engaged them. You knew how to engage him. Um, others um, seem not to know how to engage him. You engage them. Well, so it, it's, uh, mm. it's getting harder and harder for me to be the youngest person mm-hmm. in a group as yes. time goes on. I can <laughs> imagine. That yes. is for sure. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, so the experiences I've had, uh, both, you know, so I'm from a family where I have aging parents. I have yeah. kids in school. Um, I'd like to say in, in some respects, um, there is not a challenge that my you know, my extended family hasn't faced that someone 
you know, in, in a, a community situation. Have to face. And, 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 and look, don't get me wrong. I've had I've had an outstanding life up to this point, of course. and that's um, and I'm grateful for everything that I've had. And, and um, but and you can't you can't always we like to say step into the shoes of that other person. Sometimes that's very hard to do because you just you just can't relate to necessarily to someone that is you that's know right. depending on the particular thing. Uh, but you got to listen, and by connecting through you know my work, I've done a lot of work with elders, and what you learn is that if you if you if you're not careful, you pigeonhole people. Like oh, so here's what elders need, and people right. check off a, a laundry list. That's not what you learn after spending time. So you were learning with elders, or you were doing your work. Yeah, through the you're gathering data, whatever whatever the case may be. Oh. You recognize that within the, these kind of demographic groups, there's a range of skill, ability, needs, and interests that you have to be mindful of as, you know, as a government person if you're going to represent, say, elders. Well, what does that mean? It means it means a bunch of different things. For some folks, it means a terrific exercise program or enrichment at the senior center with programming, trips, whatever the case may be. For some folks, it's it's meals on wheels, and and not just the fact of the food, but recognize a big thing that elders, some elders face, is isolation. So that connection exactly is it's not it's the food, but it's of also course. someone putting eyes on you, the human connection, knowing the a little bit about you, being able to chat with you, um, and that I mean that that's one small example of how you kind of can develop that empathy or that respect, the way you put it. Um, to recognize what well, you know, what are the services people need? What can government do well? There's some stuff it can't do well, but what are those things? And recognizing the diversity of need within certain communities helps you do a better job. So uh, you're going to continue this um, this quality because it's um, inbred in you. You are not merely using them as potential sources of data mm -hmm. against which you're going to articulate mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, implement the legislative bills, mm -hmm. uh, although that is important. It is. That it is. was not the only reason. There is an additional reason, namely the love of people. Mm -hmm. And you're going to continue this, I hope. I, I, when would, you become I, I would hope so. You're I, not going to become the kind of mayor whom I'm going to call and I'm going to be told he's so busy that you can't see him for another month. This no. kind of alienation no. is what needs to be um, to, 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 to be changed. I think. Do you so. agree? I think so. You know, this. You know, so the the job of mayor scales a little bit. You know, there's a big mm -hmm. difference between being the mayor of Boston and being the mayor of Melrose. Correct. And I don't mean in in mm -hmm. in you know, Boston's a much, it's obviously a huge metropolitan yes. city. It's got a big bureaucracy. And it's, I mean, you're still the leader. You still set the agenda for the town. You still have that bully pulpit to yes. try to move the city in a direction that you that you might want it to. But the nice thing about being the mayor of a town like Melrose, a city like Melrose, and that, a lot of people do that. They think of Melrose as a town for good reason, because there is an, inti uh, an intimacy yes. and a collegiality that makes it, you know, a pleasure to get up and go to work. It's you know, my it's it's actually a you know a smaller constituency than my rep district um, by a significant amount. And uh, I think of it this way, I guess. So when um, our, our outstanding member of Congress, Catherine Clark, had this seat before me, and she ran for the state senate, and I ran for the rep seat, and then she ran for Congress. Very successful. And the question for me was, in certain respects, well, some people think, well, the next step up on the ladder is running for Senate. Because that's, you know, that's the ambitious thing or whatever the case may be. And I thought about it. I did. And there's something, there's something to that. But, you know, really, I really got into this to represent my community. I don't want to be president or governor or member of Congress or whatever the case may be. And as you kind of, as you get a bigger district, it becomes a lot harder to have that one-on-one -on -one connection, that personal connection that makes you really good at the job. I think. And that's what you're looking for. And that, I mean, and that, that's, I think that's, you know, one of the reasons I'd be good at the I job think. is because of the importance of that connection. I see. And the importance of uh, community. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, at the expense of sounding as if we'll be gossiping, <laughs> uh, 
how well do you know this uh, candidate whom you'll be running against? Do you know some of them? Very well. Yeah. Very well. They're all, you know, they're all, look, we, the, we also have the good fortune in this city that uh, historically, for the most part, we do politics right. And we, I think we do politics um, where everyone is interested in moving the community forward. People might have different experiences, different ideas, different ways of going about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I respect, uh, right now, there's four other folks running. I respect them all. I've worked with them all on things. Um, and should I be successful, I would hope to continue to tap their experience and knowledge about you know the particular things that they're really good at, mm -hmm. um, because we're all in it together ultimately. And it is not a con, you know, it's not a popularity contest. It Correct. is, it is, you know, at its best, it is a thoughtful idea, uh, a thoughtful conversation, really, about again how we can do in my mind how we can do a little bit better, how we can you know. Uh, my kids can do a little bit better than I did. Um, you know, just make that progress. Keep mm -hmm. making that progress and continuing to build the community. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish yourself from any one of them? What is your distinguishing characteristic that I would like to call Paulian, <laughs> uniquely yours, that qualifies you to be a particular kind of man that reflects your particularity, your individuality? Sure. Your passion, mm -hmm. your politics, mm -hmm. your uh, and so on. I'm not sure if there's one thing, and you know that that, that, well, that could that's be a question. Name one or two. Um, experience, I, I think, is a big thing. I, I have done a lot of work in city government as an alderman, and before that, you know, in some certain volunteer capacities and things like that. And I know very well how the state works. I've worked in the executive branch, and I've worked. In the legislative branch, okay. uh, those relationships matter. They're a big deal. They're, the ability to leverage those relationships, you know, for what you talked about a little bit earlier about you know, running with the leaders and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's important. You know, being able to to have a pre-existing relationship with with a governor Baker, with sure the connections, Spil Spilka or, or yeah. Speaker DeLeo. Uh, the other chairs that have particular expertise in transportation or economic development, uh, I think that makes a difference. Of and course. it's not just it's not just government because I've had the good fortune to be a chair and work on some very big issues around workforce development and benefits and the minimum wage and paid family leave. Uh, that collaborative process involved myself and Senator Lewis working very hard to convene folks from across Massachusetts to build the best idea we can, a sustainable, successful idea with buy-in. So it's not just working within government, it was working with um, Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, Mass Taxpayers Foundation, along with some labor groups, some um, faith-based organizations, Incredible. you know, kind of across the spectrum. You have their phone numbers, you have their emails, you can call them. And look, sometimes... You can invite them. Sorry, sometimes they're like this, and and sometimes for good reason. This but is what we're calling experience. I think, yeah. And, and you know, managing those relationships, recognizing there are certain sensitivities, but yeah. bringing people... And it, I will say, it, it doesn't always work. Believe me when I tell you, it doesn't always work. Of course. Um, so part of that experience is recognizing persistence matters too. Patience matters. Patience as matters at time. Building and, a consensus. And listening. And listening because there are folks that come to the table with constituencies or concerns that aren't going to be accommodated 100% because you can't. then you can't make a deal. Correct. Right? If everyone kind of sticks to their guns or stays on the sidelines. That's right. You can't get Because to that. principles matter yep. sometimes. And sometimes... Values matter. And sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes mm -hmm. you just got to go to the mat exactly. on things. But that's not... You try to make those things as few and far between because the most important thing you learn, I think, out of that kind of consensus building progress, taking on big, contentious, expensive, challenging issues, is that if you can do that, then the next time... Because the, the, the players don't change a ton at least organizationally, right? Mm -hmm. So the next time you have to confront an issue mm -hmm. that's a big issue, there is a level of trust amongst those folks, amongst the stakeholders, so that the next time you have to engage, there is a little bit of trust, there's a little bit of familiarity. So that, again, you're not always going to get to yes, but at least you have, you've built up a little 
have a little faith and credit so that you can move forward on that next issue. You can find those places where you can agree or at least move forward on the next thing, on the next thing, on the next thing. And now, let's talk about your uh, potential uh, constituents. Indeed. As I uh, think of them. Some think uh, housing is a perennial issue. Sure. Water bills, electricity bills, mm -hmm. uh, keep on going up. Yep. Uh, something, elementary schools in particular, mm -hmm. are not as well funded as they should be. As you know, there was this uh, contentious yes. issue uh, that uh, just passed. That's true across the state. We're facing the same thing at the state level. Correct. How, how to resolve funding issues for That's education. Right. Some of your constituents think that um, the demographics are changing. Mm -hmm. And in that the needs and uh, passions and interests of the younger population mm -hmm. uh, that come from diverse backgrounds sure. who are beginning to be part of the community mm -hmm. in Melrose need to be accommodated, mm -hmm. need to be recognized. Yeah. They need to be made feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. They need um, to feel that they are part of the Merosian community. Mm -hmm. Look at the uh, differences of the needs of the constituents. Mm -hmm. um, how are you going to accommodate this? Uh, that's the trick, right? Mm -hmm. That's the trick. Is to At the State House, uh, you've developed um, skill sets mm -hmm. uh, for the last 10 yep. years yep. because you knew the players. Yep. You know who they are. That was true in city government before that. That's right. Mean, the same. The, the same. Know, it's Correct. A, it's a smaller legislature. It's that's 11 right. folks, but the same but basic the ideas apply. The same basic idea is going to haunt you as a mayor. Uh -huh. uh, and the mayorals, if you have noticed, is becoming an increasingly attractive city, yes. uh, partly because of its geographic location, Absolutely. its proximity to downtown Boston. Yep. How many places that you know are places in which you could just embark on the Orange Line and be uh, at a place like Berkeley College of Music, mm -hmm. in which I teach, mm -hmm. in about 30 minutes without ever wanting to on drive. On a good day. On a right. good day, <laughs> because good driving day. Uh, facilities around Berkeley are prohibitively mm -hmm. um, expensive. Yep. Uh, so the public uh, transport, uh, transportation system is what one relies on, mm -hmm. uh, which makes the city very attractive. Absolutely. And additionally, Absolutely. let's face it, it's quaint shops, yep. Main Street, mm -hmm. the lake, the mansions, mm -hmm. uh, the beautiful houses on Bellevue, Lincoln Street, mm -hmm. Nelson Street, so forth and so on, mm -hmm. uh, are houses and uh, residences, dwelling places that people would like to, mm -hmm. to move to. Yep. And the new, the new population is looking out for sure. this. And then there is the older population represented by the types whom you talk to yep. at Dunkin' Donuts mm -hmm. who won't hold on to the past. Yep. And here comes a mayor who is relatively speaking young mm -hmm. uh, who is going say. to be <laughs> a mayor for the city, a mayor for everybody. How are you going to do that, Paul? It's tricky, right? I mean, because they, the hardest part of the job, in it's, and this is true of any kind of government service job, is sometimes you got to say no. Right. There is what well, the the reality the city faces from, you know, day to day nuts and bolts is it's a limited budget and you can only you can only get so much out of it. You have to be creative and you have to be innovative. Okay. But to your point about, you know, the city's changing. Well, all cities are changing and they're always ch and they're changing all the time. Melrose is more uh, economically stratified. Right. Because you're absolutely right. The. It's a regional problem. Housing prices are exploding, and that creates certainly creates barriers to entry. Right? How do we how do we make a community where, if you are a teacher in the Melrose Public Schools, if you uh, start out at the Department of Public Works, the pay scale there means you can't afford to live in the city Definitely. on your salary. Exactly. That's I mean that is a daunting daunting challenge. And I've, so we've approached it. The city's done some really good things. Yes. And, but uh, we probably need to do more. Like we've done zoning overlays and recognize that um, the so-called smart growth, trying to build around some of the assets you talked about, like the commuter rail to take some cars off the road and make it a little bit easier for folks uh, to
to get around. Mm -hmm. That's a good start. We've done this kind of zoning overlay because mm -hmm. Melrose grew up with the you know the kind of the the backbone of the city or That's the central right. corridor of the city yeah. was a rail line and some industrial use that That's came right. along the with that. Line. Yeah. That's that's you know that's all gone. No, it's never going to be no. doing anything. Now you have like the that. orange line. Exactly. And Connect so, the green line yeah. to so, the red line. So we overlay that so yeah. that you know there's opportunities to develop that stuff in a very thoughtful way. And we've also done kind of some inclusionary zoning that recognizes if we're going to do that, we have to have uh, an affordable piece to it, an inclusionary zoning piece. So that right now in certain developments, if you're going to build, you need to be 15% affordable in terms of the you know what you build, or if that's not practical for any number of reasons, you pay into a fund. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. And I, I think because we're not going to build a lot of housing stock here. Mm -hmm. there, there's certainly there's, there's, no there, land. there's certainly opportunity, mm -hmm. but you know there's no like you see what they did at Market Street in Linfield, which isn't mm -hmm. residential. It has a residential component, but mm -hmm. right, we're not going to redevelop Mount Hood or Bellevue Golf Course. That's you know, We're not going to develop the fells. Yes. Um, and we, we have to recognize that and be thoughtful about that. So what are other ways other than creating affordable housing that we can help folks? Well, I think the, with some of the resources that we, that we generate, some of the yeah. money yeah. that we generate from our, our, our inclusivity piece, we can be a little bit more creative. And that might mean... Um, First time home buyer assistance, where folks are, they've got a great job, they're working hard, but because of the way the economy is working, they can't save. So the down payment becomes a big problem. A big problem. Yeah. Or, you know, just financing the loan, getting you know, some of those of back office costs. Credit scores. Right. If we can help <laughs> out with that a little bit, that's crucial. Without creating yes. housing, because, yeah. you know, we're up against such a tough market. The fact of the matter is, you know, we've had. Because the economy is doing so well, I just saw this number the other day, you know, we've created a quarter of a million new jobs or something like that. We've had a population spike and housing has grown at like one quarter of that. You know, demand is growing, supply is not keeping up, so the prices go up. Very hard to fight against that dynamic, mm -hmm. particularly, you know. And minerals in the beginning scale, to suffer right? from that. In the scale, mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the rental market, can we help, you know, you need sometimes first, last, and, and a security deposit. Can we help folks out with that piece? Again, that, are, that might be very capable of paying something close to a market rate rent, but can't get into the market because of those barriers. I think there's opportunities to do some stuff like that. Okay. What is in the horizon for Merrill's in your judgment? What would, what would be something specific? that no other mayor has thought of, uh, that you would be thinking of, that you'd like to bring to, to Melrose. What would that be? I tell you, so one, I'm sure you've thought about this. I have indeed. And I mean, they, there's a million ideas. Yes. Um, Give but me a feel. One thing, one thing that I think is, is, is very interesting, a huge opportunity for Melrose, is you're always looking to build on your strengths and build on what you have. So we have a, we have a very strong small business community, particularly the Main Street Corridor. Yes. We have a uh, very, very strong um, creative and performing arts uh, kind of institutional support here. And you've seen it even pushed down into the schools. We have an outstanding drama program, both the band and the orchestra at Melrose High and the chorus as well are really feeding into the rest of the arts community. And we have, you know, we have so many others. We have, um, we have, I'm drawing a blank, which is awful. Um, Melrose Symphony, we have Polymnia, mm -hmm. we have um, some other small, you know, mm -hmm. blue of a kind. We have all these assets um, and we have some great institutions um, mm -hmm. like uh, Memorial Hall and the auditorium at the middle school. Beautiful. Uh, at the state level, I've been able to generate some resources mm -hmm. to invest into those facilities um, to keep them vital or to make up for some lost maintenance time that's very hard for the city to, and to keep up with. But if you can kind of yes. recognizing, again, we're never going to bring Raytheon to Melrose. So what is economic development? What is economic growth that is consistent with our character and consistent with the changing demographic? Well, it's, it's entertainment, it's services, 
it's restaurants, it's those kinds of things. And um, you'll be more than willing to work with uh, developers. Absolutely. You're not simply going to say, well, uh, developers have their own agendas. Uh, I live in a capitalist society, mm -hmm. and uh, as a mayor, I cannot intervene and uh, gear and suggest to them where they should develop and what they should develop. Correct. Instead, right. given your values, which uh, impress me as humanistic, mm -hmm. um, and your uh, skills, um, you're going to uh, work with developers. It's, I mean, developers uh, are like anything else. Mm, they're going to come with their own agendas, they but as a agenda. mayor, who knows the needs of a city, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to channel the resources of the developers in a skillful way, which you have the, developed at the State House. There are, they are human beings, after they are. all. And, you know, the, like, you know the, there are good and bad politicians, there are good and bad doctors, teachers, lawyers, whatever the case may be. That's true of developers. And you can find folks, there are some that, I think are not as inclined to work with the city, that aren't as inclined to embrace a vision and understand where we want the city to go. Um, and you'd certainly want to, you know, it is a capitalist society and private property is private property, but with creative zoning, with, you know, a skilled planning board, an excellent city planner like we have right now, you can direct resources, you can create vision and have people buy into it. And that's what I like about this kind of connecting and almost branding the community even more than it is as an arts and culture community mm -hmm. helps create an atmosphere and a destination kind of effect for what's kind of a small town. Mm -hmm. Because what, what Main Street is ultimately all about in terms of the success of the, each and every business that's there is a quality experience and foot traffic. So if we have you know, an outstanding symphony, which we do. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not just the symphony, it's delightful and it enriches the community, but it also generates traffic, foot traffic, customers for downtown. We can capitalize on that, make it grow, kind of make it a little bit more robust, and that will in turn draw, you know, appropriate scale businesses that want to add to the atmosphere of Melrose so that the well, next restaurant wants to come in because you pursue things like that. Mm -hmm. African Ascent um, was truly privileged uh, to interview this uh, fertile politician uh, who is uh, looking for uh, your votes Absolutely. so that he could be your next mayor. This has been your host, Theodros Kiros, for African Ascent. Cheers. My pleasure.